It is my pleasure to have here with us today Ravi Agarwal to discuss his new book, uh, India Connected, How the Smartphone Revolution is Transforming the World's Largest Democracy. Mr. Agarwal is currently the managing editor of Foreign Policy magazine. Before that, he spent more than a decade with CNN, where he worked in New York, London, and most recently in New Delhi, where he was the region's bureau chief. The book has received quite a bit of praise already. Fareed Zakaria calls it quite simply the best book about India today. Uh, Nicholas Thompson, the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine, says the story of how India got wired is one of the most important in the world today, and you won't find a better guide than Ravi Agarwal. That conversation couldn't be more important for us here at Google uh, to embrace robustly just given the fact that we are one of the key drivers of the smartphone revolution. 80% of the smartphones in India are Android smartphones. So I, I don't think we can be thoughtful enough um, about ensuring that our products and technologies not only help build a more technologically enabled India, but a better India. And to unpack, distill, discuss that even further, um, I'll bring Ravi up on the stage. Thanks a lot. I want to start off with, with the smartphone revolution. You talk about how in 2000, 20 million Indians were connected to the internet. Uh, in 2017, that number was 465 million. And you project in 2025 that that number is going to be more than a billion. And you, you talk about the ways in which that's similar to kind of the advent of the automobile um, and the transformational impact that it had here in the United States from kind of the creation of suburbia, the interstate highway, to where uh, very often someone got their first kiss, long weekends, um, all sorts of kind of tremendous impacts. And you talk about how the smartphone is doing the same in India, which makes it not simply an evolution, as it's been here in the United States, but a revolution. So would love for you to kind of talk about how India got here to this moment. Where is it right now? And where do you anticipate it's going to be 10 years from now as a result of the smartphone revolution? Sure. That's a great question. Thank you for having me. Thank you, all of you, for attending. Um, and really, it's it's very special for me to come speak at Google. And as Arun said, Google's playing such a huge role in the growth of the internet in India, and in fact, expanding uh, the pie of internet users in India. So to begin with your, your first point about how India is going through a smartphone revolution, the reason why I use the word revolution in the book, and I don't use it lightly, is to contrast it with the way in which the West has, people in the West have discovered the internet. So for most of you in this room, you know, my assumption would be that you know, sometime in the late 1990s, you had a PC and a telephone landline, and then you got a, a dial-up internet connection, and then you evolved from there to uh, DSL and cable broadband, and then you got your routers, you had Wi-Fi, and then eventually you had 3G on a phone, 4G on a phone, and you are where you are today. Um, in India, a very small slice of Indians who were rich, privileged, usually urban, often male, um, had access to those things. Only 2% of Indians had access to telephone landlines in the year 2000. A similar percentage of Indians had access to PCs, and that's why there were only 20 million Indians online in the year 2000. And the numbers then begin to jump very rapidly. In 2010, there were 100 million Indians online. By 2015, there were 300 million Indians online. And now we're crossing half a billion. The projections are that it'll reach 800 million by 2025, uh, and then a billion shortly thereafter. All of this growth is going to come from smartphones. Um, why? Because smartphones in India are very cheap. They are easily accessible. They are, for most Indians, not just a smartphone, as it is for you guys here. For most Indians, the smartphone is their first camera. It is their first screen. It is also their first Walkman and MP3 player. It is a first of many things in one device. And that's why it's as transformative as it is. For most Indians, this is a gateway to many forms of technology, all of it in one go. You could be illiterate in India, um, and you can still speak to your phone. Uh, you, you know, the old internet was mostly for English speakers in India. The new internet is for people who speak, uh, you know, a multitude of Indian languages. And thanks to Google, in part, those languages are all now accessible on the internet. Um, there's a great analogy with with the car, which you brought up, and 
I like to compare the moment that India is going through right now to the moment that America went through a century ago. So, you know, America invented the car, and with the car, you created roads and highways and the interstate system. And then with that, tens of thousands of jobs were created, and America built suburbia and the picket fenced home. And with that, you had the commute. And along the commute, you needed to create an infrastructure. So that infrastructure was gas stations and multiplexes and movie theaters and the drive-in restaurant and so much more, the 7-Elevens. Think of all of those things as a national infrastructure across the country. And it wasn't just that. There was a cultural and an imaginative infrastructure as well. I mean, for most Americans, the car was their first private property. It was literally a tool of mobility. It was uh, the vehicle in which they sort of injected their dreams and their ambitions, you know, for the baby boomer generation. In Hollywood, it was enshrined. I mean, think of the, the race and the chase and the bank heist. Every Hollywood movie of a certain era was defined around the car. The car defined Americans. I mean, if you drove a pickup truck or a sedan or a hatchback, it kind of explained who you were and where you were headed. Take all of those things and transpose it to India today. The smartphone defines who you are. Are you an iPhone person? And therefore, do you have $1,200 to spend on a phone? Likely not in India, I mean, because as we know, <laughs> Apple hasn't been able to make serious inroads into India. Um, but the phone says a lot more about who you are. And by the same token, the phone is creating an entire infrastructure of payments, of communication. It's building trust um, with maps, with education, with various tools that people are using. Um, for all of those reasons, for a country that is as young as India is, average age, 27, average income, less than $2,000 a year, you take all of those things together for a country that's marching and on the rise. And the thesis of my book is that this one device, this one tool, will end up being incredibly transformative for the country. That's, no, and I, I think one of the stories that you start the book off that really illustrates that uh, compellingly is the uh, story of Pulwati, uh, who is a Google Sathi, and you can explain what sure. that is. Um, I, I have to admit, I fell a little bit in love with Pulwati reading about her. She's like on her bicycle going yeah. around rural Rajasthan, introducing yeah. the internet for the first time to, yeah. uh, to women in these villages. Um, would love for you to kind of talk about how you first like found her, sure. her story, and then what kind of broader lessons um, we can draw about her example uh, and the penetration of India, sure. not only for women, but for, for rural communities. Sure. It's so great to talk about Fulwati here because I'm coming full circle. I, I found Fulwati through Google. Um, and not the search engine, but literally through people at Google who said, you must take a look at Google Sathi and you must look into this story. And so I did. Um, for those of you who don't know, Google Sathi is a program uh, at Google where um, Google's partnered with many NGOs across the country. And it is um, uh, giving, first of all, it's training rural women how to use the internet. And then it's arming them with uh, smartphones and tablets and a bicycle to then go out into other villages and teach and train other women how to use the internet, how to familiarize themselves with the internet. Why is this important? Well, um, you might remember when I was starting off, I said the old internet in India was urban, elite, and male. Uh, it was also English. Um, and the reason why I say male is that uh, even in 2014, uh, about 70% of internet users in India were male, 30% were women. In villages, uh, only one out of 10 internet users were women. And so the big gap was rural women and women more nationally. Uh, Google obviously, you know, and you guys work on this, realized that this was a great market to tap. And not just for economic reasons, but also for humanitarian reasons. And so the Sathis, what they've been doing is, is in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer conversational way, have been able to train other rural women to use the internet. And the reason why this is important, again, is that illiteracy is rife in these parts of India. 
Um, you know, in Rajasthan, the state in which I met Fulwati, um, female literacy rates are at about 50%, um, which means there are all these women who cannot read or write anything at all. And so the internet for them was always going to be a thing that they could never dream of using, not on a PC, not on a phone, not on a regular phone. And voice technology changed all of that. Fulwati, uh, and I begin the book with her speaking to some, some other villagers, and she says, uh, you know, ask this thing, Google, ask it something. And most of them don't know what to ask. I mean, you know, and then one woman says, well, um, you know, show us the Taj Mahal. And uh, a video pops up. Uh, she says it in Hindi. She says, Mujhe Taj Mahal dekhao. And a video pops up. And they press play. And for the first time, they see moving imagery of this monument that they have all grown up as knowing as the most beautiful thing in India. It was a very profound, moving moment for me as well to see that. And uh, it gives you a sense of, of, of how technology really can break through so many of the boundaries that we've built in India, uh, not just gender, but also caste and geography and language and literacy. Um, and, and Fulwati was, uh, if you read the book, was just a great example of uh, a woman who was completely indomitable in spirit and uh, you know, was able to venture out into all these villages and very enthusiastically be sort of a, an internet evangelist uh, or a Google evangelist. Uh, and she was paid only a very small amount of money uh, to do this, but was doing it mostly because she, she was really excited about the project. Um, for those of you who've been to India, you know, it's, it's quite rare to see women on bicycles wearing a full sari and heading out into the villages. And, you know, the Safis are doing just that, uh, which is a real testament to their enthusiasm for the Internet. Yeah, and it's, it's what's, what was interesting about her case is you, you talk about the fact that she had a husband that was, like, very supportive of, of what she was doing, which enabled her to be such an enthusiastic kind of ambassador for the Sati program. Uh, there's a quote in the book where you talk, you brought up caste, you, you, where you talk about how Karl Marx in the 1850s thought that the railroad was going to get rid of the caste system in India. Um, and there have been all sorts of technologies since then that have been like, this is the vanguard of like, pu maybe pushing against some of these more ancient social or cultural systems. Uh, and those obviously failed, um, but you feel more bullish about the smartphone yeah. Um, what's different about the smartphone that you feel is going to break through some of these more uh, older kind of patriarchal systems? So uh, I am more bullish. Um, there are still obstacles. For example, there are entire villages in India where the smartphone is banned for women. Uh, and I go to one of these villages in Gujarat. And the men I spoke to there uh, said that you know, women just can't use this. They're not smart enough. They don't have the, they're, they, they're not capable of dealing with the internet. And, and really what they were trying to tell me without saying it in as many words is that they were frightened of what it would mean to give women access to the internet. Uh, it, they were frightened of what it meant to give women freedom. You know, they had built around, um, in fact, entire societies were built around uh, you know, uh, patriarchal systems where women had very little agency. And so, in a sense, one of the greatest obstacles to allowing the internet to reach uh, all Indians is, is men, and mostly rural men. But that said, um, I think the reason why I'm more bullish about the phone than any other technology is that the phone is a catalyst, and it's coming at a moment when so first of all, it is cheap, it is accessible, it is aspirational. Um, but it's coming along with a range of other forces. There's a confluence of events at play. And those events are globalization, cheap technology, the creation of smartphones, which, you know, let's face it, are unprecedentedly you know, compact and powerful and able to take all of these things into one device all of these other devices into one device, um, but also rising income levels in India, the ability for uh, bigger Indian companies to take 
big decisions, set up big infrastructural projects. You may have heard of Reliance Geo, which is a company that, you know, for the first six months of its launch, essentially made data free in India. So if you look at all of those things together, we're at a moment fairly unprecedented in India's history where the smartphone is just perfectly poised to reach so many people and to give them all these different things in one go that were not going to happen organically. Mm. You know, PCs were not going to reach a majority of Indians organically. Cameras were not going to reach a majority of Indians organically. But you put it into one device, you put all of these things into one device at a very low price point. Uh, Geo, for example, leases out a very, you know, it's a very basic phone, but it's kind of a smartphone for $23. Uh, it's a three-year lease for $23. You can buy uh, certain Chinese and Indian-made phones um, for somewhere between $50 and $150. Now, at that price point, when you include all of these things, it's irresistible. What are the, the kind of gaps that you talk about the smartphone being able to bridge is the urban-rural gap, but also kind of the linguistic gap. To your point earlier, the mobile phone has primarily been, um, or the smartphone uh, and PC before that was primarily targeted in the English-speaking audience, and that's that started to change. I think one of the stories that really illustrates that is uh, the story of uh, Abdul, yeah. uh, who started this education app. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, so uh, I have a chapter on education, and one of the, the, the people I profile in that chapter, his name is Abdul Wahid, and he uh, he's a real sort of fixer-upper of a character. Uh, didn't go to an English school growing up, so he never really spoke English well. And, you know, in India, to succeed, uh, you, you know, speaking English is a huge leg up. And um, so he started using an app called Hello English, which uh, is one of India's top educational apps. And uh, the way Hello English works is, as long as you speak some other Indian language, say Hindi, and you can read the English alphabet, you're able to then play these games that teach you uh, or help you improve your conversational English. And so Abdul Wahid was playing this game every day, sitting you know, on the toilet seat, sitting in traffic jams, and he got better and better and better. And he was ranked number one out of millions of, of users worldwide. And so I found him and sort of profiled him. And his story was amazing because he essentially became a confident uh, man and a confident teacher. He runs a, a coaching institute in Rajasthan through not only Hello English, this app, because he couldn't afford Rosetta Stone or going to a school. Um, but he also um, became, you, you know, through, through YouTube and watching videos of motivational speakers and stuff like that, he just was able to become a very confident educator. And, and that struck me as, as, you know, the kind of thing that, that it's hard to quantify nationally. Like there's no, you know, metric to look at those kinds of intangible improvements in people's lives. But also in that chapter, um, uh, I also looked at learning outcomes for, for children. Because I think if you look at the biggest space uh, for disruption in India, it really is early childhood education. Um, and the reason is that, you know, India has opened a lot of schools, but these schools don't always train people in the right way. Uh, and there are all of these studies that show that learning outcomes for children was greatly reduced after the age of seven, eight, which meant that the reason why they were dropping off on math and literacy is because, frankly, they couldn't read. They couldn't read and write, and so they weren't able to progress further. And there's a lot of research now, and there are many NGOs that are working in this space, but the phone has really come through as a tool that could allow people to uh, improve their basic numeracy and literacy uh, at the lowest levels, uh, which would really work at a mass way to India's advantage. Uh, I want to kind of take a step back and kind of think about some of the, the macro trends that have uh, enabled a lot of the, the evolutions that you discuss in the book. Um, it strikes me with the kind of analogy of the automobile that it required a robust partnership between the state and private companies to get that right. And kind of the state knowing when to lean in and when to lean back. Um, at the end of the book, you actually do a really good job of, of 
framing up that narrative in the context of the of mobile phones in India. Um, there's like an Indian American businessman who has a conversation with Rajiv Gandhi uh, to kind of really pave the way to bring um, telephones to India, which was a, a luxury as late as uh, as the early 1980s. Um, would love for you to kind of talk about that evolution, uh, particularly with an eye towards what it, what is the right way that kind of private forces and, and public institutions can work to, together to really take advantage and bring to fruition the potential of, of sure. these new technologies. Sure. You know, the telephony in India has mostly been a private sector story. So the public sector story was what you were describing of the 60s, 70s, early 80s of the state trying to get basic telephone landlines to people. And that was something that the state largely failed at. And one innovation that really worked for the state was when they opened what was known as these STD, ISD, PCO boots. And these were basically um, telephone boots, but they were manned by uh, shopkeepers or 7-Eleven, mom and pop store owners. Uh, they were basically at marketplaces. And you would go in and you could uh, uh, you know, pay for a metered call, uh, local or international as the case would be. And that allowed many people to get access to telephony in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise. But you know, in terms of mobile telephony, when the state first uh, began to sort of uh, you know, open up in, in that sense, uh, they, there were still many, many restrictions for the private sector. And, you know, it was through sheer um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, force of will in, in the form of the private sector that, you know, 3G and 4G finally took off in India, um, basically through advertising and, and offers from the private sector that, that allowed it to reach Indians in a mass way. And then the second wave was through hardware. So, you know, the, the handsets and, and cheaper smartphones, all of which are, are led by the private sector in India. Um, I think the space we're at now is, you know, the, the government has largely ceded a lot of the space to the private sector, but I think where the government could be very important uh, and where the private sector could work closely with the government uh, on is, is regulation in terms of, you know, how to regulate this market, how to regulate the entrance of new players, how to regulate uh, foreign players versus Indian players. But then the second thing that is very important to me and, and is really a large part of the book as well is to, to sort of deal with some of the adverse effects of, of the smartphone boom in India. And those range from addictions to fake news to pornography and to, and we can get into to some more detail on those topics, but just to use the analogy with the car once again, you know, governments around the world and the private sector uh, partnered on cars um, with advertising, basically, in, in terms of telling people that the car is clearly a tool for immense good, but it is also a weapon of mass destruction. So you need to not drink and drive. You need to wear seatbelts when you're driving. And those were public interest campaigns that were very important, I think, for societies around the world. And I've begun to see smartphones as something quite similar um, to the car in that respect, where you know, smartphones and technology can also be immensely destructive to societies, especially a society like India, which is you know, still so nascent and gullible in so many ways. Um, with superstitions in, in, in various communities. And the notion of being able to see this device as something that has immense potential for good, but also for bad, and what to do with that and how to deal with that is very important. And I think that's a space that um, public and private can really cooperate on. Yeah, I think that's a great segue into what I'd love for us to unpack a little bit more. Um, the, the first part of the book is very much about the opportunities of the smartphone revolution in education, healthcare, and um, empowering women all across the country. I think the, the second part is when you talk about some of, uh, some of the potentially negative consequences. And you talk about re the story of uh, Sheikh uh, Halim uh, and the lynching that took place um, that was more or less driven by communication messaging apps. Um, talk. Talk to me a little bit about that, and this is really me putting my Google News Initiative hat on. Um, 
the evolution of misinformation, deep fakes, synthetic media misinformation, how you see that playing out in, in India and the role and responsibility that you feel um, platforms uh, should, uh, should take uh, in addressing that. Sure. So, uh, you know, many of you have heard the stories of, you know, lynchings that have taken place in India, Hindu-Muslim related violence, mob violence. And much of this tends to stem from uh, the proliferation of fake news on messaging apps, specifically WhatsApp, which is very popular in India, but also other uh, messaging apps in India. I hesitate to put the blame squarely at the place of messaging apps because it is not as if rumors didn't spread before. It is not as if there were not lynchings and mob violence before technology. Technology has just allowed for the spread of these things faster and quicker uh, than was possible before. Um, what often happens is that people in India are often not equipped in the same way to decipher and deal with fake news as people may be in the West. And think of it this way. I mean, when you all first started using the internet, let's say in the late 90s, you had a Hotmail account and you would get a chain mail. And the chain mail would say, if you don't forward this to 15 people, you'll be unlucky in love. And you're laughing there. I mean, many of you have probably hit forward and sent it to 15 people until a friend or two says, hey, this is stupid. Don't do that. And then you don't do that. But remember when I was talking about the, the West's evolution versus India's revolution? So you all have evolved with the internet and you've evolved with your mistakes and you've learned not to make those mistakes over time. So you are now more discerning consumers of the internet and of fake news and you, you're better able to to judge, you know, what is true, what is false, what smells right, what to forward, what not to. Um, that's less so of the case in India because, again, hundreds of millions of people are discovering the internet right now on smartphones, and they haven't built the same nose for fake news. Um, add to the fact that they are, you know, not as privileged. They don't have the same levels of education. Um, they don't have the same levels of media literacy, necessarily. And um, various societies in India were quite superstitious to begin with. So you take all of those things together with the power of social media to amplify uh, in a viral fashion, and you have a cocktail that's quite dangerous. Um, it's a huge challenge for, I think, tech companies to figure out, but also society to figure out and the government to figure out. And as I was saying earlier, I think you know, media literacy would be something that I think tech companies, if they can play a part in helping communities understand the basics of how to decipher what is news, you know, you know, who's funding it, what's the dateline, is it written by a human being, you know, is it from a wire service, what is it? Um, and then also just the basic pitfalls of what happens when you forward something, basic, you know, how this can be exponential, you know, how to trust, how to verify. That's very important. It's a conversation that has just begun to take place in India. Um, but, you know, as a journalist, I can tell you with elections around the corner in India, this is an issue of grave concern. A lot of things could go wrong before Indian society figures out how to get it right. Yeah, and it's, uh, as you well know, it's supposed to be quite the challenge here in the States. So Absolutely. I, I imagine it's even, it's even, even greater. more, even yeah. greater in India. On the same vein of like some of the potential pitfalls of uh, the smartphone revolution, one of the parts of, the, one of the chapters that really kind of uh, sh shocked me, was like entirely news to me, um, concerns just broadly a conversation on, on sexuality and how it shows up. Uh, online, um, but you talk about kind of the advent of very violent pornography and how that's become readily accessible to um, to hundreds of millions of people uh, in in India, um, and you don't necessarily draw a direct causal relationship between that and the horrific um, crimes that we've seen in the last few years uh, in, in India. Uh, but you do kind of allude to the fact that there is something there that's worth exploring. Based off of kind of exploring that story, do you feel like tech platforms have a responsibility to curb or curtail that sort of content? This is a tough question because um, I, the last thing I would ever want to advocate is curtailing uh, or censoring content. And yet, pornography is one of those things where you have to wonder 
are people properly sensitized to deal with it? And the reason why I say this is, look, growing up in the West is so different from growing up in a village in India. If, if you grow up here, you are sensitized at a young age to the human body. I mean, you go to the beach, you see, you know, if you're a young boy, you see a woman's legs at a very young age and, you know, you talk about sex, you go to co-ed schools, you have a healthier relationship with sexuality. Um, if you are a young boy in rural India, you may have a very, very different relationship with the human body, with sexuality, with sex. Um, given that backdrop, if your first experience of sexuality is violent pornography, and add to that the fact that this is not something you can talk about with your family, this is not something you can talk about at school, so you have no way of deciphering it and interpreting it, there are real problems with that. And, you know, as a journalist, again, when I was reporting in India, one of the things that uh, the worst stories that I, I often had to cover were very violent gang rapes um, and other types of rape across the country. Um, and it was a deeply, deeply disturbing thing to cover. And on the one hand, of course, rape happens everywhere. This is not uniquely a problem, uh, unique to India. It's not unique to any country. But it did get me wondering, you know, is there a connection between this explosion in pornography, this explosion in access to pornography? Because again, you know, if you were a teenager in America 10, 15 years ago, you could hide a Playboy magazine under your, your mattress. Um, for most Indians, that was not an option. The, you know, privacy works very differently in India. Um, access works very differently. You don't grow up, most Indians didn't grow up with a, uh, a TV and, and, and a VCR or a DVD player. So the internet changes everything. A private viewing device changes everything. And I do wonder quite openly in the book whether there is a link between pornography and rape, whether there is a link between um, porn and uh, you, you know sexuality in India. And I don't have answers. I mean, this is where I have to be honest in that, you know, a lot of the data shows that um, there may not be a link. Um, but but I, I sort of closed that chapter, you know, just very much in two minds. And I think this is a conversation and a debate that I think needs to take place more widely in India in a very open fashion. And the reason why I say this again is that sex and sexuality, uh, you know, is not new to India. If you go back 500 years, 1,000 years, you know, think again of the Kama Sutra and think of temples in India that really enshrine sex and sexuality. Um, so notions of openness about sex should not be new to India. But a notion of sort of prudishness was introduced into Indian society through colonization. And, and you know, it was more of a Victorian import. Uh, you know, think of the blouse and the petticoat and the you know, uh, so many things that, that didn't even exist in India before that. So it's, the waters are, are quite muddied on this, but I, I do think it's an issue that, that needs to be debated openly. I, I wanted to pivot a little bit um, to kind of the relationship between or the role of the state in, uh, in some of these technologies. Um, you, you kind of talk very compellingly about the fact that India is the world's leader in digital blackouts, and specifically, most of that takes place in the state of Kashmir. Uh, and then you also kind of talk about uh, some of these very digital forward initiatives like Other, for example, which you know, like, sound incredible in terms of their potential if we can get it right. But um, there have been conversations around data breach and privacy leaks from that. The you know it it's the kind of theme that percolates throughout the book. Like this is an incredible technology that like we should that can do all these incredible things in uh, in really addressing and solving real problems for a lot of people. Uh, but when but we have to be careful about like the state's role um, and particularly trusting a state with data and privacy mm -hmm. um, would be great to get your sense of do you I mean having written the book now, like, do you feel like the state in India is equipped to properly manage and handle the, this data in a way yeah. that ensures that we get the better end of, uh, sure. of the potential? I don't know is the honest answer. I mean, what we do know is that everyone needs checks and balances, including the state, including big corporations. So for example, um, uh, if you haven't read this yet, um, India has more internet shutdowns than any other country on earth. 
uh, Syria and Iraq are two and three. And what this means is that at any given moment, the state can just switch off the internet. So it basically has uh, the, the biggest mobile provi cellular providers on speed dial, and it can call them and say, all right, in this particular area, shut down the internet. This often happens in Kashmir after encounters with terrorists. Uh, and the reason, the logic is that, again, to use the car analogy, if there's a car crash right outside here, the police will likely cordon off the street. And so, uh, digitally speaking, if there is a clash between the police and militants in Kashmir, um, the, the authorities would shut off the internet so that uh, militants wouldn't be able to uh, you know, send out imagery on social media or seek help or anything like that. Now, on the one hand, there's a clear uh, use for this. But on the other hand, there is immense misuse especially if it isn't properly codified, you know, under what circumstances is a government allowed to impose a shutdown? Who makes the decision? Is there any accountability? Is there any recourse if a wrong decision was made? And then linked to all of that is over time. So Kash the state of Kashmir, for example, um, it lost hundreds of millions of dollars in lost business. And this is according to a study by Brookings because the internet was shut down for months. So, uh, you know, those are clear examples of the state. Um, you can call it overreaching. You can call it, you know, taking a draconian approach to dealing with a problem. But again, for all the good that the internet and the proliferation of smartphones can do in a place like India, there is so much gray area and so much of sort of new areas of regulation that, that haven't really been covered or discussed in the public space, and internet shutdowns is chief among them. Um, Aadhaar is a very interesting topic in and of itself. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's the, the biometric ID system in India that has now signed up, I think it's about 1.2 billion people. It's a, a system that basically allows people to say, I am me, so it's an ID card uh, with fingerprints and retinal scans included. And um, this is part of a very polarized debate in India. There are people who will say that this could have immense positive impacts in terms of um, you know, people being able to have an, uh, an ID to open bank accounts, to, open, to get cell phone lines, to get subsidies from the government, so on and so forth. But there are many who will also tell you, uh, critics who will say that um, this could be misused by the state. It could be, there could be leakages, there could be hacks. Uh, you can't change your fingerprints, so once you lose them to someone else, you're in trouble, so on and so forth. I tend to fall somewhere between, the, in the middle of that debate, where I think you can't deny that there is immense potential to this. And I think the government, on the other hand, needs to address the critics and openly acknowledge that there have been leaks. And, and this, again, is where the private sector could, could help uh, in terms of how to plug those leaps, how, how to have better security, and how to be more upfront about where things stand, better communication all around, which I think the private sector has immense experience with. One of, um, one of the striking chapters is on a topic that folks who have followed Indian politics over the last couple of years would be well aware of demonetization. What's interesting about that particular chapter was you kind of follow the story of this auto rickshaw driver and kind of his journey through dealing with the aftermath of demonetization. There's a line around you wondered like whether or not he'd ever be able to learn how to use a smartphone and really um, really be able to join in this like increasingly digital economy. Um, what responsibility do you think society and tech companies have for those who in the short term or maybe medium term, maybe even long term, are being left behind by the, yeah. this increasing wave of digitization? So you can contrast Fulwati's story with the story of Sarvesh, who's an auto rickshaw driver I met in Delhi and followed around for two years now. And he knows deep down that he just cannot use a smartphone. He can't bring himself to use a smartphone, doesn't understand it, is very intimidated by technology, can't even afford it to begin with. Um, and the reason why that even came up is um, during demonetization, which for those of you who don't know, was a moment where the government recalled the two highest currency denomination notes, 
from the market, which was 86% of all cash, and replaced it with two other notes, the reason being that they wanted, A, to get rid of so-called black money in the system, which is uh, money that hasn't, uh, on which income tax hasn't been paid, and B, to, to move India towards digital payments. Um, but in that chaotic moment, which most economists worth their salt have decried as, you know, a horrendous, stupid decision, which has cost India as much as 2% of its GDP, but in that chaotic moment, many people suffered for their livelihoods, including Sarvesh, this auto rickshaw driver, because all of his his uh, rides were paid for in cash. And because people didn't have cash, he wasn't making any money. So he was really struggling. And in that moment, when I was interviewing him uh, for CNN, I, I asked him, well, hey, why don't you use Uber? Uh, why don't you sign up for Ola, which is Uber's Indian uh, equivalent and competitor? And that's where it all came up. He just was very intimidated by technology, um, didn't have a smartphone, and felt like this was just not for him. And and I contrast that story with Fulwati's because it's one thing for us to think of technology as, you know, if you just build it and people will come, that's not necessarily going to happen, especially in places like India where there are so many barriers. And think of not just people like Sarvesh who are young. Uh, I mean, he's in his 20s uh, and should really be able to learn. Um, but think of older people in India. India has about you know, 250 million people who are over the age of uh, 55, 60. And for those people, technology is very intimidating. It's very hard to just be given a smartphone and then learn how to use it and learn how to communicate and learn how to use apps. So um, that space was very important for me to explore as well because it's it's sort of a, a counterpoint to the narrative that tech is necessarily going to transform India. And as much as tech will transform India, I think India will also transform tech. I think, you know, they're, they're, India has all these unique ways of dealing with tech. You know, Indians are still uh, much more comfortable with cash than they are with digital payments. Uh, Indians prefer dual SIM phones over single SIM phones because they like to switch between service providers. Indians prefer prepaid cellular contracts instead of postpaid because they don't trust large companies to give them good service. Not only that, large companies don't trust them to pay up on time, so they prefer prepaid options as well. So for all of those reasons, India is just a unique market um, and a very large market that I think uh, is, is going to evolve and change in its own very special ways. And uh, my last question before we open it up for a Q&A. Um, so given that, given how unique India is and, and the realities that we've unpacked here uh, so far, it, let's say, you know, hypothetically, you are a product manager overseeing Android or you're in charge of uh, building out products for the next billion users in India. Um, what are some of the things that you'd keep in mind or that you would feel are, uh, are considerations that would be front and center in how you approached um, rolling out those products and the sorts of products that you built? That's a great question. Uh, I'm sure Google is doing all of these things already, but I would, if I was a product manager, I would bring on board people like Servation and Fulwati. I would bring on board people who are not literate, people who have never used any technology before, and see what kinds of problems they're encountering. Uh, I would, the English market in India is already very well served. Um, it's the Indian language market, Hindi, Bengali, Tamil, Telugu, so on and so forth, that is still underserved. And I would explore how those users engage with the internet, what they need, uh, what they're struggling with. And then linked to all of that, I would really focus on digital literacy and media literacy. I think uh, there is, with the great power that companies like Google have in places like India comes a responsibility, I believe, to help people navigate things that could do immense good but can do immense harm as well. And so, you know, stepping in where the state has failed, you know, to help people understand, you know, to learn how to engage with news, to learn what is right, what is wrong, to verify. Um, to build that 
you know, that inner sense of uh, that, that aptitude of being able to gauge, you know, what is real and what is fake. That will be one of the great challenges for Indian society. And if I was able to do that um, as a product manager, I think that's one of the things I would spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think whoever is able to fix that in the private sector would have done an immense, immense service to a place like India. Because you know, India doesn't have to repeat the mistakes of the West. India, India's path could be different through technology. And we all talk about the word leapfrog. Uh, and India will leapfrog in many ways. It will leapfrog credit cards. It will leapfrog uh, so many different things that the West has evolved through. But leapfrog isn't necessarily a good thing. You can leapfrog to a bad place as well. That's where I think the private sector can really help with and sort of speed up that learning process and not assume that that learning process is already in place. So we'll uh, open it up for audience questions. There are two mics, just one there and, and one there. Um, if folks want to start queuing up. Hi. First of all, thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Um, I think throughout this talk, uh, mostly or even or even completely, we've um, contrasted India with, with the West, with the United States specifically. And, uh, um, you know, there are some ways where you know we share similar problems. One one thing, one obvious thing that we did talk about was um, uh, sexual content online. I think even in the United States, uh, the availability of problematic content online far outpaces the availability of good sexual education in most of this country. Okay, so just as an example. So I am wondering what um, uh, what lessons have you learned from your exploration of how India got connected uh, uh, that might apply to the United States as well. Wow, so the other way around. Um, well, that's a great question. Um, I think because India has discovered all of these things later, it is sort of learning from the West's mistakes as it goes along. But in terms of lessons from India, um, you know, one takeaway I think would be that cultures use technology in ways that are very unique to them. And I think especially for, um, for investors here, you know, anyone who's dealing with products that are global, I think it's very important to see each culture, each community, each country as having very unique ways of dealing with technology. And so, for example, the, the, when I was talking about cash, um, you know, Indians, India is what I like to call a very low trust society. And, and that's because Indians almost always just assume that anything that could go wrong in a system will go wrong. Uh, Indians don't show up for meetings on time because they don't expect the other person to show up on time. Uh, Indians like to pay for things in cash because they think something could go wrong with a credit card. Um, so, you know, cash on delivery is a very big thing in India. Um, Amazon's big competitor in India, Flipkart, began as a company that was um, delivering books to people, and then those customers would pay for it in cash at their doorsteps. Um, and the reason why I'm explaining this as a lesson for America is that, um, you know, each market will develop in its own way and will have its own sort of unique relationship with how technology develops and how it should be used. Um, that said, uh, I wish I could tell you that India, for all of its great connections with faith and religion, you know, India was the birthplace of four religions, it was the birthplace of yoga, I wish I could tell you that Indians have a better relationship with screens, and they don't. Uh, I think uh, addictions, as much as, as much as a screen addiction is a problem here in the West, it is becoming so in India. And so in that sense, uh, India really has no lessons to offer. Uh, and and the, the, the solution to that problem will have to be a global one. Thank you. Hi, Ravi. Thanks for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. I wanted you to go a little bit more uh, into that you briefly mentioned regulation, uh, regulation of technology, and the foreign versus Indian company dynamic. 
And I've seen many uh, stories recently about the government wanting to change how things are and the status quo of things like data localization, stuff like that. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how things look right now and what you think will happen in the future. Like, is India going to become another China in terms of foreign companies not being able to play at, yeah. on the same level playing out? I mean, I don't think India can become another China, and I don't think uh, even the government wants to do that. China is just such a different market to begin with. Uh, their internet is, you know, almost like one language. They have apps that are, as you all know, an entire ecosystem in and of itself. India's evolution with the internet has been so different. Number one, you know, India has more than 200 million English language users. Um, right from the start, uh, Western companies were allowed in and became the leaders of the Indian internet, Google being first among them, but also Amazon and Uber and so many other companies that uh, made it big in India quite early. I think what you're seeing now more recently in terms of regulation is, is India and this government's reaction to um, Western companies having such a large slice of the pie. And so, for example, in the e-commerce space, you know, if the Indian government is restricting uh, the amount that Western companies can own in a company or the amount of business that they can do in a certain space, I think they're doing that primarily just to protect local companies from being able to survive and stay in the game. Uh, I don't think it will ever rise to the levels of either China or even sort of the protectionism that we saw in India in the 80s. Um, because India, I think one of the things you must uh, see about India is that, you know, every politician, uh, every regulator looks to 1991 as the year in which the Indian economy really opened up and benefited from opening up. I, I just cannot see India going back on that. Uh, I cannot see even this government, uh, you know, stepping back on that front. I think they realize that uh, opening up is where, where their strength lies. Uh, and I think they also realize that the market isn't static. It's growing so fast that there's enough space for everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I remained largely ignorant of India, short of some stories from Maroon about his personal travels before this talk. And I'm very interested in, you mentioned the way that India will change technology. Um, is there infrastructure in place for uh, either developers in India or phone makers in India to really learn at scale how to build better technology for those that are often overlooked in the West, um, poor people? beyond just the cost of phone and sort of reducing access to entry, actually building technology that serves, you know, at the app level or one layer further, um, some of those more rural and often separated populations? Yeah, there is. That's a great question. I think most of it is led by the private sector, again. Um, if you look at, um, so I, I coming back to education, I talk about a, an Indian company in my chapter on education. It's called Ake Step, which means one step. And they have developed, um, essentially, they like to think of themselves as, you know, for example, the Uber of primary education, where they've created a platform where other developers can jump in and create multilingual content for primary schoolers or primary school teachers to be able to use for their students. And it really is a great example of sort of, you know, Indian tech developers using their technologies. And this was inspired by Aadhaar. Uh, so it's sort of an open stack kind of system that allows other companies to create other things around it. Uh, think of Aadhaar itself, the biometric ID system, which is Indian, it's indigenous, uh, it's Indian run, Indian engineers. Um, and this was the, the government's initiative, but it was led by you know, private sector techie, uh, Nanda Nilekani, for those of you who don't know him, uh, who found co-founded Infosys. Um, but again, the basic logic being that uh, you can harness Indian strengths and Indian workers uh, to create these open platform systems that could then plug into other aspects. You know, it could plug into the banking sector, it can plug in 
to uh, the government subsidy schemes and so on and so forth. So I, I think that space is where most of the innovation is taking, taking place, um, more than any other space, I would say. Uh, you know, if, if you look at other spaces like search or messaging, I would argue that the most innovation is taking place in the West or maybe in China, and India's development on that front is more derivative. My question was more towards the future. So if you look at India right now, uh, it is the country is still not fully industrialized. There are a large fraction of the population is living um, in, ru um, in ru rural villages. Uh, but now, at the West, uh, we are talking about in the next decade or two how, uh, say, artificial intelligence will take away jobs. Uh, and I would still assume that maybe a self-driving auto rickshaw could be as profitable as a self-driving car for a company that wants to make it. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts about what, uh, how a country like India that is so behind in terms of technology and in terms of industri industrialization would be affected, uh, say, 20 years down the line? When yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and I try to deal with this a little bit in the book. So there are two things going on. On the one hand, um, the rise of smartphones will lead in the immediate future, I think, to immense job creation. So if you think of the e-commerce market, which is going to grow leaps and bounds in India, um, the kinds of jobs that you create with the e-commerce market are ideally suited to the Indian labor profile. So you've got delivery jobs, you've got packing jobs, warehousing jobs. Those are exactly the kinds of jobs that rural Indian men mostly are exactly primed for. Uh, they don't need more education. Uh, those are the kinds of jobs they're looking for. They're relatively well paid for what they're looking for. Uh, so there are enough studies out there that show that those kinds of jobs will create you know, tens of millions of jobs over the next 10, 15 years. That's sort of the shorter term perspective. And then there are many other stories of, you know, like there's an Indian uh, version of LinkedIn for blue collar workers. It's called Baba Jobs, which was then bought over by Quicker. And basically it sort of connects people uh, who are seeking a certain type of job to that particular type of employer. You know, if you're a Domino's Pizza in India, for example, um, you know, you are looking for a delivery man the standards for selecting a delivery man is are pretty low. Like if you show up for the job interview, you're going to get the job. So the real challenge there is connecting the seeker to the employer. And technology will fix a lot of those issues. So in the short term, I think there's an immense benefits. The longer term is where the troubles come around uh, as um, these giant warehouses get automated, as deliveries get automated, as uh, cars get automated. The thing is, it's hard for me to imagine those things happening in India the way I can imagine them, them happening in the West. See, it's one thing to imagine uh, a drone delivering a package to you know, this giant house in Pasadena where it just drops it off in the garden, delivery done. But can you imagine the same drone delivering the same product to a slum in Mumbai where you know, you're trying to hover over this tiny shack and there are like 200 children playing around there and then one of them grabs the package, someone else grabs the drone and you know, that, that, that's the end of the model right there. Um, it's hard also to imagine um, you know, the algorithm that would work for uh, you know, automated driving in India. I, I used to drive in India and you know, you're navigating not just roads and cars, but you're navigating people and cows. You know, so, and other animals. And it, it's hard to imagine uh, automation really working uh, in these tiny, narrow lanes where it, it takes immense ingenuity, you know, to scream and shout and corral support for your car to get out. Uh, so, uh, on the one hand, I think when these things eventually get automated in India, um, you know, we will see immense job losses. I just, I, I can't bring myself around to seeing that moment. I can't imagine it. I don't know if you guys can at Google, but it's, India's a very different market. Yeah, and it speaks to our responsibility to kind of be thoughtful about some of those consequences before they, yeah. they really manifest. Um, our last audience question. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, Thank you. I have a question. You mentioned a couple times about the biometric ID system. 
Um, but you also mentioned that India is a low trust society. Has there been any worry or discussion about adopting some of what the Chinese government is doing using the biometric system? There has been. Uh, I think the debate has been restricted mostly to uh, sort of more elite policy circles and amongst journalists and civil society. And I don't imagine that, you know, out of the 1.2 billion people who've signed up, you know, I would imagine the vast majority haven't really thought too much about privacy. And you have to think again of where they're coming from. Uh, most have come from a place where they had no form of ID, no driver's license, certainly no passport, um, no way of getting uh, access to government subsidies or products. So this was a big leap, and it was a useful leap for many people. And despite being a low trust society, it's very telling that they were able to invest so much trust in the government in the hope of something better. Um, and that speaks to the potential for technology in India and how much, how much hope people have for what technology could do and how it could better their lives. But as I was saying earlier, um, th there are many, many things that could go wrong. And, and that is a debate that needs to be had. It is uh, something that the government needs to be more open uh, about. Uh, there certainly have been massive leaks. And you know, fessing up to them nice and early and being transparent would serve the government well. I mean, the, you know, everything has leaks. It's, it's owning up to them and dealing with them that eventually will win people's trust, I think. So that's a longer journey for India. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so just to clarify, so overall it's been very beneficial, and the risks are, like, what are the more immediate risks, if not? For Aadhaar? Yeah. I think uh, the immediate risks are, A, uh, large-scale leaks, B, the information from those leaks being harnessed in ways that are particularly insidious. So um, it could be voter fraud, it could be uh, impersonation, it could be opening fake accounts. Um, there's a range of things that one could see happening based on leaked biometric IDs. All of that said, one advantage of this system is that, A, it is a government controlling it, not a company. And B, it is data that is fairly dumb. I mean, it is your ID, but it doesn't have your browsing history. It doesn't have your uh, sort of preferences. It's hard to sell that to an ad firm and see, you know, it's, it's not of immense value to someone else uh, in the way that uh, other leaks that we've seen from, from other companies could be. Um, Facebook's leaks, for example, through Cam Cambridge Analytica. Um, so in that sense, I think the potential for Aadhaar to be dangerous is less so than uh, other leaks that we, we now know about um, from the private sector. All of that said, um, one shouldn't dismiss uh, the what, what could go wrong with Aadhaar. And I think... Um, you know, it's again, it's a conversation that needs to be had more openly and robustly in India. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.